Hello, everyone. Um, I am thrilled to get some time to sit down today and talk with John Boniface. He's the president of a nonprofit organization called Free Speech for People, and they are doing remarkable work. Um, if you haven't heard about them, you're going to hear about their mission and about the efforts that they're undertaking right now to try to disqualify insurrectionists from continuing to serve in our government. Um, talk about a worthy cause, talk about a heroic cause. We're gonna talk about that. And, um, but first I wanna start with uh, saying, John, thank you so much for being here. I know that our Team Justice members and the folks who watch our videos on the Justice Matters channel uh, are really excited to hear from you. Can you tell everybody a little bit about your background and then about your organization, Free Speech for People? Sure, and, and Glenn, thank you for having me. I'm happy to be with you. So my background is I'm a constitutional attorney. I've been involved in democracy fights for 30 years now, and I'm the co-founder and president, as you said, of Free Speech for People, which is a national nonprofit, nonpartisan organization dedicated to defending our democracy and our constitution. We were launched on the day of the U.S. Supreme Court's ruling in Citizens United the FEC in January of 2010. That ruling, of course, equated corporations as people with political speech rights and swept away a century of precedent barring corporate money in elections. And since that time, for a dozen years now, we've been engaged in the fight to end big money in politics, to protect voting rights and protect our elections, to challenge corruption in government at the highest levels, and to take on unchecked corporate power. Uh, and most recently, to hold insurrections accountable uh, via Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. So tell our viewers, what is Section 3 of the 14th Amendment? What does it um, give you the opportunity to pursue? Well, Section 3 of the 14th Amendment is a critical constitutional provision for protecting our republic. It was part of the 14th Amendment enacted after the Civil War. And it was designed by the framers of the 14th Amendment to protect the Republic from then ex-Confederates who were in positions of government power or sought to attain positions of government power. And the view was that they had just engaged in an insurrection in our country. So they had taken an oath of office to defend the Constitution. Then they turned around and engaged in civil war. And they were not able to serve in public office Again, and that's what Section 3 of the 14th Amendment says. It says if you've taken an oath of office to defend the Constitution and then you engage in insurrection, you're barred from ever serving in public office again. But importantly, they didn't restrict it solely to the ex-Confederates. They had a debate on that, and they were clear that they were also going to apply it to any future insurrection. And now, for the second time in our nation's history, we've had an insurrection, January 6, 2021, and Section 3 of the 14th Amendment must be applied to anyone who's taken an oath of office and then turned around and engaged in that insurrection. And so let me read just from select portions of Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. No person shall be a senator or representative in Congress or elector of president and vice president or hold any office who, having previously taken an oath as a member of Congress or as an officer of the United States to support the Constitution of the United States, shall have engaged in insurrection or rebellion against the same or given aid and comfort to the enemies thereof. Those folks, by the very language of the 14th Amendment, are prohibited from serving in, in let's just boil it down, federal office in the future is do i have that loosely right well it's actually extended to state and local office so it's right. not and, solely and, uh, federal i agree and yeah. let, we'll focus it because um we don't have 17 hours to discuss all yes. the implications right but you're right that's an important inclusion because we have seen what's gone on in some of these states yes um but remaining focused on federal office what is the enforcement mechanism in your view for disqualifying these insurrectionists? Well, there's nothing in the language of Section 3 of the 14th Amendment 
that requires, for example, a prior conviction or even a prior indictment or a tribunal of any kind having to rule before those who are in charge of regulating state ballots enforce Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. So we've been calling on secretaries of state and chief election officials all across the country to apply the mandate of Section 3 of the 14th Amendment based on their own authority to regulate the state ballot. So for example, Glenn, the Constitution does not allow a 15-year-old to run for president of the United States or to run for Congress for that matter. And any secretary of state who received a petition from a candidate of that age, and my, my daughter's that age, I think she'd be a great candidate, but anyone who received a petition to be on the ballot at that age for that kind of office would be automatically barred based on the constitution, based, based on the age qualification. There's also a citizenship qualification, there's a residency qualification, and following the 14th amendment, there's a qualification that you must have not taken an oath of office and then engaged in insurrection if you want to serve in public office. So the enforcement of this really goes to the secretaries of state and the chief election officials who are in charge of regulating state ballots. It's also true that during the reconstruction era, when the 14th amendment had just been enacted, the justice department, federal prosecutors were engaged in removing people from public office who were ex-Confederates and based on Section 3 of the 14th Amendment were no longer allowed to stay in office. The Justice Department could be doing that again today, uh, but that's a separate matter and outside of the hands of a nonprofit uh, to, to enforce. But certainly secretaries of state have the authority and responsibility in our view to enforce this mandate. Are they doing it? Not yet. We are in contact with a number of Secretary of State offices. I will say that some are seriously talking with us about their requirements on this. Um, you know, when it comes to Donald Trump in particular, uh, we're making the case that they should issue a declaration ahead of any potential announcement he might make, uh, making clear that they will not be placing him on their state ballot. And we're keeping at that and we're partnering with our revolution in that fight. Uh, and there really are many people all across the country now that are joining us in calling on their secretaries of state to enforce that mandate. So what have you done? What has free speech for people done to my characterization, step into the breach? Right, well, so there's two tracks that we've taken on this. The first track, as I said, is calling on secretaries of state directly to enforce this mandate. We've issued letters to every chief election official in the country. We've now more recently issued this declaration that they can sign declaring Donald Trump as disqualified based on all the evidence already available that he incited this insurrection, engaged in it, and is barred from ever holding public office again. The second track is to have launched a series of challenges, legal challenges on behalf of voters to specific elected officials turned insurrectionists who are seeking to be on the 2022 ballot. We started that in January of this year with a voter challenge to Madison Cawthorn's eligibility to appear on the ballot in North Carolina. Uh, we moved over to Georgia and continued with a new challenge against Marjorie Taylor Greene. And we challenged Paul Gosar, Andy Biggs, and State Representative Mark Fincham running for Secretary of State all in Arizona. Uh, and they have taken you know, different, different tracks, those, those cases. Uh, but I think we've won some critical precedents, court precedents for future 14.3 cases. Now, these challenges that you are taking on, um, have similar challenges been taken on before by private citizens, by nonprofit organizations attempting to disqualify insurrectionists? No, and, and the reason why is, as I said, in the, in the prior era when the 14.3 cases were getting brought, they were being brought by federal prosecutors, uh, removing you know half of the Tennessee Supreme Court, which, for example, was removed from office as a result of that prosecution. But here we're dealing with the second insurrection. We haven't had you know, in 150 years an insurrection. Now we have this second insurrection. And so far, the Justice Department hasn't moved forward with that kind of prosecution, though we think they should. Uh, and that's required, as you've highlighted, this stepping into the breach. We, we, we do believe 
that these elected officials turned insurrectionists need to be held accountable and that 14.3 needs to be enforced against them. Do you see any indication that DOJ is intending to, to take this, uh, this battle on and try to begin to disqualify insurrectionists? Or have you seen no overt signs of that? Unfortunately, we've seen no overt signs of that. And we have serious concerns about what level they will be holding Trump and associates accountable for all the federal crimes they've committed, not just those associated with the insurrection. Uh, but nevertheless, there are courageous voters that are willing to step forward and have in these cases. Uh, and as a result, for example, the Federal Appeals Court of the Fourth Circuit, U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit, which covers North Carolina and other states, ruled very clearly uh, just a, a couple months ago that, in fact, the insurrectionist disqualification clause, Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, applies to current day insurrectionists. Now, Cawthorn's attorney, James Bopp, had argued up to the Fourth Circuit that an amnesty law of 1872, which was passed by Congress four years after the enactment of the 14th Amendment, that provided amnesty to ex-Confederates, that that somehow applied to Madison Cawthorn as well. And he got a Trump judge to agree uh, with him at the district court, but the federal appeals court reversed that and, and made clear that there is no amnesty uh, for modern day insurrectionists that the section three of the 14th amendment applies to them. So following up on the fact that you see no outward signs that DOJ is prepared to take this battle on or even has an appetite. I mean, I'm not inside the head of my old organization though I worked there for decades and I have a pretty good sense of how we operated and how they operate presently. Um, and I'm not going to make this a let's beat up on Merrick Garland session because I have no interest in beating up on Merrick Garland. I think he is you know, doing a thoughtful job. He may be the king of circumspection. My concern is he's moving too slowly and he's not meeting the urgency of the moment. I'm still hopeful that we will see a big overarching indictment come down uh, for Trump and all of his criminal associates. I, I still think that will happen. But you know, I went back to his words when he was speaking about how he ran the Oklahoma City bombing investigation that he supervised. And he said this, he said, we promised that we would find the perpetrators, that we would bring them to justice, and that we would do it in a way that honored the Constitution. Now, as a former career prosecutor, I embrace that. I celebrate that, honoring the Constitution in the way we go about investigating and prosecuting crime. But my concern at the moment is honoring the Constitution can't be a halfway proposition. Absolutely. And the 14th Amendment, Section 3, I, 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 there is no part of the Constitution that's more important than other parts. Maybe there actually is. But when you have insurrectionists, based on the public reporting alone, members of Congress who seem to have participated in the insurrection, people who continue to give aid and comfort to insurrectionists, when you have them running for re-election, intending to burrow back in our government and let's call it what it is, kill our democracy from within, it doesn't feel like that part of the Constitution is being honored by the Department of Justice the way it needs to be. Um, I, I want to ask you about the interplay between these challenges that you're bringing and the federal statutes that provide for a prohibition from future uh, public service, future um, holding federal office. For example, treason, right? Yes. Part of the um, authorized sentence is prohibiting somebody who is uh, guilty of treason from serving in federal office in the future, insurrection and rebellion yes. has that same possible penalty. Interestingly, seditious conspiracy does not. But can you, in, in layman's terms, for me, as well as the viewers, kind of talk about the interplay between those authorized punishments in the event of conviction for certain crimes and kind of the approach that you're taking going into the courts and filing legal challenges to disqualify insurrectionists. Yes. Well, I think you're absolutely right that there's a urgency to this moment, right? We have a 
defining moment for our constitution, our democracy right now, and we need all hands on deck. And our view has been from the very beginning with this particular fight that we could not wait uh, for one line of attack dealing with criminal prosecution to be somehow completed before ensuring that this part of the constitution be enforced. There's no requirement as I've said for there to be any conviction or indictment even in order for section three of the 14th amendment to be enforced. And in fact, what the framers saw here was a threat to the Republic for these people, as you highlight, staying in government, burrowing themselves in after having taken that oath to defend the constitution and then turned around and engaged in insurrection. So that urgency is, is here and now. I think there is an important interplay with those statutes you cite, but the distinction we would draw is that as much as the Justice Department is focused uh, potentially on, on the criminal question, a criminal liability and criminal prosecution of these elected officials turned insurrectionists, they have to, at the same time, as you highlight, be focused on that part of the Constitution that requires protecting the Republic in the urgency that, that we have. And, and that means not allowing Donald Trump or any other elected official who engage in the insurrection from holding public office again. So it will not suffice, Glenn, for the Department of Justice to issue an indictment and even engage in criminal prosecution. And, and Donald Trump then becomes president in the middle of that or after that. that, that doesn't suffice. We have to go all the way in protecting the Constitution and the Republic. And that means enforcing Section 3 of the 14th Amendment now. So um, let me just nerd out a little bit. Would you, would you believe that if there was, for example, uh, a prosecution brought against a member of Congress for having committed insurrection or rebellion, and they were convicted, and the, the judge included in his or her sentence um, that prohibition from holding office in the future, would that kind of moot out your need to continue to pursue your path to disqualification for that same member of Congress. It would for that same member of Congress. Right. But what we don't want to do is let the secretaries of state and chief election officials off the hook, where they somehow are going to sit around and wait and look for the criminal prosecution and the Department of Justice to act before they act. And I'll tell you, some of these secretaries of state are saying that. You know, Secretary Bill Galvin of Massachusetts, where I happen to live, recently was quoted. Uh, saying in, a, in an article that he needs to first see a conviction in order to enforce Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. That is patently against the legislative history of Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, not what the language and text of the very constitutional provision says. So he's not following his duty and his responsibility to enforce Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. He's just going to pass the buck to the federal Justice Department for them to act first before he acts. And we know, we, we know, Glenn, that any prosecution that might take place at this time, even if it happened today, is going to take a long time, long after state ballots are determined for the Republican primaries uh, in, in all these states. And so it's just not sufficient to, to look solely at the Justice Department and what they're going to do when it comes to enforcing Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. I think you put your finger on an overarching theme, um, and that is so many people are sitting around waiting for somebody else to act yes. or something else to come to fruition. I have been saying for a very long time now that I don't think any prosecutor wants to be the first one to indict a former criminal president. I think everybody's going to want to be the second prosecutor right. to indict right, right. A, a former president who committed crimes against the United States, but we don't have the luxury of sitting around and waiting for somebody else to go first. You know, we're, right. we, we're looking to Georgia, Fonnie Willis, we're looking to the Department of Justice, we were looking to New York until there was that inexplicable decision to not pursue charges against Donald Trump over the considered opinion of the trial team. So, and you know, yes, we're looking for states to do what the states ought to be doing. And everybody seems to be waiting for someone else or some other organization. Yes. To act. And, you know, I don't want to look back from the end of our republic and see that nobody had um, had the courage to step up and be the first one to take on what is obviously criminal activity 
yes. is obviously disqualifying activity. Um, so that brings me back to free speech for people because you all really have stepped into the breach. I think this is more than we should require of our citizens to fight this battle. This is a battle that I think we empower and expect our governments to fight on our behalf. But right. the fact that you were not somebody sitting around waiting for somebody else to take the lead is, in my, in my view, heroic um, and, and a democracy-saving effort. So let me um, have you share with the viewers, how can they find free speech for people? How can they help your mission if they're interested in helping your mission? Sure, thank you. And we appreciate that generous support. You know, we are proud to be working with people all across the country who care deeply about our democracy and our constitution, and many of whom are our clients in, in these fights. Uh, so we are at Free Speech for People eager to have people join our, our fight. You can sign up for updates at freespeechforpeople.org, learn more about the work we're doing all across uh, the democracy uh, space, and, and also uh, join us in calling on secretaries of state to follow the mandate of section three of the 14th amendment. We have a dedicated section of our site on this. It's 14 point all spelled out three. So one, four P O I N T three dot org gets you to that site has all the materials about our voter challenges that we've launched, but also our letters to secretaries of state and how you can get involved in signing a petition and calling on your secretary of state to follow this mandate. And the one other thing I'll add, Glenn, is on the New York front, you know, there's another person who needs to step up and that's the New York governor because with the Manhattan DA having not followed through on what the veteran prosecutors who were carrying out that investigation wanted to do, which was to follow through with prosecution of the Trump organization. Uh, it's clear now that the governor has the authority and responsibility to resp assign this investigation over to either the Attorney General of New York or another DA in New York. And we've called on her to do that. We have an ongoing petition with over 40,000 people having already signed it. And we think she needs to act to ensure that investigation continues. Here, here. Uh, and I will put links to your organization in the description of this video for anybody looking to um, connect. Um, and John, thank you so much for taking the time and thank you for being what I would call a free agent democracy fighter. I feel like there is this whole new category of uh, Americans who are jumping into the fight in any way we can and, um, and you and free speech for people are just a shining example of that. So from the bottom of this old prosecutor's heart, I thank you for that and I thank you for being with us. Um, and I hope we can get together and chat periodically so you can give us updates on these legal challenges as they make their way through the court system. Thank you, Glenn. Thank you for all that you do in the fight for our democracy. We're proud to be in it together.